Welcome back to the Travis Jones Show. Today, we have the seven habits of million dollar fitness businesses. Uh, with me today, I have Olivia Jones. Welcome, Olivia. Thank you, Travis Jones. Uh, over the last, you know, I would say eight years now, we've coached many, many a fitness business. I would say past a thousand fitness businesses we've coached now. Um, and a fair few of them, quite a few, have gone past that uh, magical million dollar mark. And it's interesting um, to take off uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I, I thought today we would talk about the seven habits of million dollar fitness business owners because they all have similar traits. Um, and we will go through them one by one. And, you know, as Tony Robbins would say, um, the fastest way to get to, to success is to model someone who is doing what you want to do. So if you want to build a million dollar fitness business, then strap in and listen to this podcast and uh, listen to the banter between me and Liv as we go through it. Mm. Although my banter could be a little bit uh, slower today, given yesterday I did cop a uh, log to the head. <laughs> she just wasn't listening as a wife. No, I'm joking. It wasn't me. It was our son. <coughs> oh. We were putting uh, some firewood in the back of the ute and Jackson pitched a, <laughs> um, a log <laughs> to the ute. Copped. And it copped lives straight in the head. <laughs> so, no, I did not beat her. And... Um, Yes, uh, she still cops it from our son, though. Though he was quite upset, and he, um, upset. You know, he says he doesn't like to hurt mum, and no one really does. But today we're talking about the seven habits of million dollar fit pros, and I think the first habit is the biggest one. And everyone thinks they, you know, wait, I'm going to actually start this first. Everyone comes to us and they're like, I need more leads and sales. And we help them with leads, uh, we help them with sales, then it breaks their customer experience. We help them with customer experience and uh, making sure they can lead the team because then they want to outsource themselves from their business and get back more time. Um, you know, all these things happen. But this, this first one that we're going to talk about today, um, this is actually something that is crucial. Mm. Um, it is crucial that you get the leads and you actually make the sales and you actually can lead your team. And you, this is the crucial number one component. And this is your mindset. You know, the, the number one habit is they stop being a victim and they create this emotional stability, controlling what they can control. They stop focusing on the outside world. They stop focusing on their competitors. They stop focusing on, you know, the problems with their government or the problems with um, anything. And they start focusing on, on them and what they can control. And they stepped up and started to be the hero of their own journey. And that started to being the hero of their own life. Um, it, it started to develop the character traits they wanted to live by and you know this stopped them falling into victim mode when things went wrong and being a victim is essentially blaming making excuses um, justifying why something didn't work um, because you know if you're a victim with marketing then the leads are weak. And or Facebook marketing doesn't work. Yeah, or, you know, the, the leads are weak, the Facebook ads don't work. And it's like, well, Facebook ads do work clearly because every one of your competitors are using them and they're using them quite well. So they're just not working for you. And you have to understand, okay, why aren't they working for me? And the hero, okay, takes responsibility. They takes ownership they take ownership, they take ownership, and they take accountability. So this is the biggest thing. You, you, to be the hero and to be the victor, okay, you step up and you're like, everything up until this moment in my life that is bad is my fault. And everything great up until this moment in my life is my fault as well. And then you can go, I'm not at effect Okay, the world is is working for me, not against me. Okay, so everything that's happening, all the bad that's happened in your life, that's taken you to this point, and it's it's defining your greatness. The challenges have come because they have pushed you to stand up, to step up, to step outside your comfort zone, to grow, to become who you should become. And I think the hero, you know, they understand the mantra, you know, obstacles make me stronger. It's like. The, the yogis have used it for a long time when they've gone, um, and they didn't realize that they were saying obstacles make me stronger. Maybe that's why the yogis are so strong. I'm not sure. But 
in saying that, obstacles do make you stronger. And the, the heroes understand that. Well, I think that comes down to as well and understanding that ownership is what I think sort of drives these higher performers to consistently seek out knowledge, to implement, execute, and then challenge what they think as the hypothesis for a particular situation. And you look at all the great minds. You know, um, it was interesting. I was listening to Jim Quick, Limitless, in the car. Um, Chapter one made me cry and inspired me at the same time. Um, The mother. Anyone who's a... (laughs) Everyone who reads that that's a parent, that first chapter will get you. Um, but he did say a really powerful quote that I didn't even realise Albert Einstein had said, obviously being that the state of consciousness where you've achieved it, like you've got a problem, the state of consciousness you're at will never be the solution. So you have to elevate your knowledge or your experience through a coach who's been through something similar and can, and can guide you through it or to go and ex- like just acquire as much knowledge as possible to go out there and execute. So it's not just acquiring knowledge for the sake of it. You have to elevate your consciousness and you have to be able to be open to other solutions or other options that are out there. And I love that, you know, obstacles are just opportunities. Um, and that's a really powerful reframe. And I think for a lot of people to understand that really successful people have learnt. And I use learnt rather than failed because they've made mistakes They've made very public mistakes. They've made private mistakes in all facets of their life, but they didn't stop there. They kept moving forward because it is that momentum that gives us motivation, action, and actually the results. And if you are overthinking which decision is the right decision, you are applying way too much weight to the universe. And it's a fantastic concept when you consider the universe doesn't really care what decision you make. It's not like there's a preordained, well, if you make this decision, you're going to get punished. If you make this decision, you're going to get rewarded. It's a very childlike um, parent almost relationship where you're like, this is your decision. And if you make the right decision, you get an, a, you know, a chocolate. If you make the wrong decision, then you're going to get punished. Um, and I think the idea behind it is that people need to understand that each decision you make, you simply understand that there are follow on effects to that decision And then you undertake those. There is no sliding doors. You're not going to know what the alternative was. So just make a damn decision and move. Mm. And every decision has a sacrifice and some sacrifices are good and some are bad. Um, The choice on that sacrifice, you get to um, decide yourself just like a nutrition plan, right? You're sacrificing the ice cream for the body or you're sacrificing the body for the ice cream. They're both sacrifices. Just which one do you want? You work out a way to Um, both. But with conscious, yeah, exactly. Um, but Educate. With, with that conscious awareness, as Liv was saying, I think, you know, your current level of consciousness won't solve, you know, tomorrow's problems and sometimes today's problems. Mm-hmm. But that consciousness will change through feedback and feedback comes from failure as well. So, yeah. yes, you can get a coach and they can model their success or you can just fail and learn from your failure and also get success. I know which way I personally have done in the past. Uh, I've done both. Both ways, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I like the coach angle because it by- bypasses the um, some of the hard work. Um, I think, <laughs> like, it's you know, fast track. yeah, it's a fast track system, right? And, and you think- model, you emulate, and you tweak things to suit your model. I don't think anyone, you know, even if we look at the gym scenario where you have a coach in the gym, you know, fitness professionals. It's looking at the fact that you don't assume that there isn't any one way that can solve a problem. You're always looking for ways to modify a plan or a system that you believe should work. But there are always, you know, minor modifications to either meal plans or recipes or ingredients or programming, regressions in an exercise. You know, I'm super fit and healthy and love training. But at the end of the day, when I did my SIJ, I just had to adjust my my deadlifts. It didn't mean the whole thing went out the window. Mm. So you're like, there's different um, patterns throughout your journey that will require adjustments. And those adjustments come best with a coach, in my opinion. Um, most definitely. I think, you know, Ryan Holiday wrote the book, The Obstacle is the Way. And everyone likes to reference that book, but I've run 
hates the obstacles. Um, so instead of just... It's like everyone loves the motivational quotes, but no one wants it to apply to them. Oh, exactly. And everyone likes the underdog, but everyone hates being the underdog. Um, so I think instead of just uh, referencing a book, we maybe should apply the knowledge from the book and understand the obstacle truly is the way. And the when challenges, we face challenges over the years, you know, the, the million dollar fit pros versus the 100k fit pros and stressed out of their mind fit pros, when an obstacle happens, like say a Facebook ads account gets shut down or or something like that they they see it as an opportunity the the heroic fit pros they see it as an opportunity to pivot to get you know outreach going to get referrals going to improve their customer experience to whilst this is happening they don't just sit in the corner and just sure. wait for Zuckerberg to reactivate their account. Um, they they actually shift, they pivot, and they keep moving forward. They act, they act, they act. They don't just dwell and sit in the corner. And, and the 100K, 200K fit pros who are financially struggling, they sit in the corner with their problems. And now all of a sudden they've they made, them, yeah, but they, they do love, love them, them because they love, you know, human beings, we love to complain. And then, you know, if I complain to you, then you complain back to me and you, we always want to complain about how our problems are the bigger problem. Um, and if someone provides a solution or an alternative, they're the enemy yeah. because the, there's a comfort in failure. It's like, you don't people, understand. Yeah, you don't well, understand my problems. People like not having success because from success, you can fall from failure. It's, it's quite a comfortable place and most people live in that mediocrity. Most people are comfortable in that mediocrity. So there's very few people that are going to question your state of mind. And I think you need to find those people to be truly successful. You need to find the people that are brave enough to call bullshit. Yeah, and that's going to be the next point. So I don't want to go into that Sorry. just yet. Just Liv's trying to run on, run ahead. Awesome. Um, but with this, um, I think we have to understand that you know, when we are the victim, we actually search out for problems and we search out for these problems and we make confirmation, we find confirmation bias. So we search for other people who have these same problems as us to show that other people have our problems. And now we create this as a limitation. Yeah. So now we've created as a fact in our brain and it's a limitation. I cannot be successful because of this, you know, say I have a small town, I'm doing Facebook ads and the Facebook ads weren't working for me. Then all of a sudden, if I, if we um, say, Hey, you can do this, this, and this, then they're like, Oh, it doesn't work for me because I've got a small town. And they'll find someone else with a small town also who wants to live in mediocrity and then talk to them in a way. It's like, Hey, you tried this and it didn't work for you either. So all of a sudden the wording so that I'd they create. So i wasting my time or my money. My exactly. Own. And all of a sudden they look for confirmation bias to uh, make their statement, they believe, a fact and then place that limiting belief inside their mind. And now when we have a limiting belief and we go back and we even try the Facebook ads, we fuck it up without even realizing it. You know, we, we write the copy wrong. We, we put a wrong ad budget. We change the targeting by accident. You know, we, we make a lead form or whatever it is that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And we start to put these hurdles in place without realizing it. We start telling people, I'm only available at 6 a.m. <laughs> like whatever it is with your ads, like you're like, oh, I was just trying to get more qualified leads. And it's like, no, you you were making limitations mm. upon yourself to prove that it doesn't work for you. So you can sit further in the corner with your problems saying, woe is me. And then you get to say, I tried everything and it didn't work. And as soon as you say, I tried everything and it doesn't, doesn't work, then you've made, you've cemented a belief in your mind that you cannot be successful and achieve your dreams. Qualified leads though, is like my, my single most hated sentence, because I think it is, if you reframe it to more aware le leads, what most people like to do is do their first Facebook ad and for somebody who has no friggin' idea who they are, go, oh, for sure, I'd love to give you money or I would love to make sure that I book, jump on your booked call or insert whatever funnel you've got. It doesn't matter how many goddamn steps you've got. It doesn't matter how much information you give them. If you haven't invested in the awareness, then you don't deserve the aware leads like you need to look at it and reframe it. So I really want everyone on this. And this is, I believe, a part of these reasons or results or these excuses is challenge yourself to reframe every one of your excuses into something that doesn't appeal to you. And a lot of people don't like the concept of aware leads because that leads to the very glaring omission on their behalf of any effort 
or expense to make people aware. And expense can be your personal pride with rejection. So, you know, Travis's, if you watch the um, podcast on five ways to generate leads uh, for free, then you can look at that and go, well, Travis walked around the mall and spoke to, you know, hundreds of people. And there was an expense there of your time, effort, money, but also pride. And that is the, the challenge that you overcame was the reward that you earned. Most people wouldn't have even taken that first step. So I challenge all of you, take your biggest excuses and reframe them. It's very uncomfortable. Yeah, it's also looking at these challenges and going, well, if I do this, what's the worst case scenario? I, I think everyone always goes, oh, the best case scenario won't work out. Well, what's the worst case scenario? If I walk up to 10 girls and offer them two weeks of free training, uh, what's the worst case scenario? They say no. Okay, great. W- what happens? Do I die? No. They just said no. Like, that's okay. People say no all the time. Have when a you, shot of vodka and but, give it a No, crack. but literally, when you literally. walk in to buy clothes at a store and someone says, would you like help? Everyone, not everyone, but 99% of people say no. no. Now, with this, like, these people are in the work in a clothing retail store get rejection all the time, but they don't see it as rejection. They're just trying to help someone. And you're just trying to help someone Most with your ad. Most of the guys ad. I know who come up and ask for help are hot, seriously hoping I say no. <laughs> <laughs> like that, oh. that would require effort. Um, but, like, I think the biggest thing is, Become a hero. Also look at uh, what I like to get most people to do, okay, and this is a little bit of a coaching lesson to start with, is write out two versions of you on how you would act in a day. Write out how the victim would act and write out how the hero would act. And I want you to write like two paragraphs. And, you know, the victim presses snooze, the victim shows up, you know, not on time for their session or whatever it is. The hero, uh, the victim shows up half assing looking at their phone during their session. The victim goes and gets a coffee and procrastinates on the leads. The victim sits there telling himself stories of, oh, the leads are weak and they're not going to answer anyway and they don't want to buy because they have no money you know the the victims like gets tired because they've been up early now so they need to have a nap you know the victim you know doesn't train themselves because how can they possibly do everything the victim then you know worries about the about money and says i can't even you know spend money on facebook ads because they don't work like the victim keeps telling this is how the victim runs their life um how is the hero and i think a very powerful thing just here is to kind of make people aware that it isn't wrong to feel those ways sometimes no. and it isn't it's not wrong to feel overwhelmed i think the tool that you're providing here is a very visible tool for choice you can look at both stories ask yourself which version of yourself you know you are being and if you've written it down it you know obviously through studies you've cemented it as part of the fabric of your learning so it's in there now so you're aware of these choices and you can make an active choice to choose the hero And so there's no demonizing the feeling. I just don't want people to think that you get to a certain stage of success where you don't feel judged or you don't feel self-conscious or you don't feel, you know, nervous or have struggles. You know, obviously COVID, it didn't matter how successful you were. There's some super, super duper stressed people right now, you know, courtesy of COVID. Um, So there's lots of different obstacles that are going to be piffed your way in life. These are the tools that are going to help you make the better choices yeah. 90% of the time. But it's also understanding these two feelings and being consciously aware of them yeah. and then asking yourself, does this feeling serve me and does it serve me going in the direction that I'm trying to go in life? And that doesn't mean you can dwell sometimes, but I think the fastest people and the most successful people, they understand how to get back to equilibrium as fast as they possibly can. And that is what the hero does. They go, this is the best me. Okay, I fell off into a victim's ver- version of me and they shift back to equilibrium as the best, best version of them. It doesn't take them two weeks, you know, four months. It takes them, you know, two hours. It takes them two minutes. The more you practice, the faster you can get back to equilibrium. And then it's also writing, you know, finishing off that hero's version of you. You have to write down exactly how the hero acts. Mm-hmm. You know, do they do they wake up? Do they not press snooze? Do they get out of bed? Do they, you know, show up before the session? Do they plan? Do they prep? Do they get their self and their state on point? You know, what do they do? You know, do they call the leads? Do they try and serve the leads they don't care if the leads buy or not they're just trying to change their life do do they train themselves do they increase their energy do they structure their time do they stay on focus like what does the hero do and the hero's version of me, like, what are the character traits? Do they respect? Are they honest? Do they have integrity with themselves? Do they do what they said they would do? Right? You know, the hero excites me. Mm. Right? And the hero should excite you as well. And I think if you can have these two paragraphs 
you know, and you're looking at them side by side in front of you each morning. And then you just say, who am I choosing to be today? Mm. And you have this conscious trigger and you go, okay, I'm the hero. Okay. I'm choosing to be the hero today. And then you move forward. And the step two is proximity and accountability. Um, this is the second habit of the million dollar fit pros. They understand that, okay. Um, you know, proximity to people doing what they want to do. Um, and more, exactly. You want to be the dumbest person in the room. Like, I, I think this is the most crucial thing. Um, it's, you know, find a room that you are, feel like you're the dumbest and your whole goal is to get the smartest in the room and then find a new room for you to be the dumbest in the room again. And as being accountable to someone that they actually respect. And I think this is the whole thing with, you know, why people hire a personal trainer as well. You know, all the information is out there in the world. Yeah. to on diets and on training and the same as growing your business right you have to sift through all the shit to try and find the stuff that works you know hiring a trainer or hiring a business coach you know shortcuts the shit you know the good stuff between the shit and you're modeling their success but it's being accountable to someone you know who knows the way you know when we look at that motivation equation it increases your expectancy Okay. If someone has a track record of results and you can see the results, all of a sudden your belief increases and go, I will stay accountable to that person because they know how to get the result that I want to get. And it increases the expectancy and belief and hope within myself to continue to show up. Now, if you can put being the hero and being in, with proximity and then also being accountable to someone, you put those three things together, that like trifecta, mm. like you know, it doesn't matter if you never did a Facebook ad in your life, you're still going to figure it out as far as how to market with any other way. Like those three things are the way. And I, I think it's a very powerful understanding that for most of us, it, it's an interesting concept that I think a lot of our fear of not being the smartest person or not having the answers comes from the education that we're all conditioned by. And when you consider the fact that for most of us, the whole concept of school is the idea that you go and you learn, but the answers are already mm. preordained. And so you're already like, you're just fighting to figure out what's the right answer that they want me to give. That's going to give me the grades that tells people how smart I am. And we're going to rank you. So we're going to actually say that this is an A, this is a B, this is a C. Now, obviously, thankfully, you know, a lot of us are very passionate about reshifting this uh, education concept, but the whole idea of school as opposed to apprenticeships and learning, like apprenticeships originally were the idea that you had no idea what you were doing. You went and learnt from someone from scratch that had been doing this for a long period of time. You had that experience and you learnt the trade from them. School was the perfect new system that indoctrinated people to the idea of corporations. It's an incredibly powerful and very frightening concept when you consider it was created to model a industrial revolution style environment where you had workers and you had a boss. And that is a very, the teacher and the students. And you were rewarded based on your behavior and how well you got according to the answers and the test that they had already preordained what was the correct answer. And frighteningly, I'm sad to think how many great minds were lost in that process because, you know, so many of us did come out of that process afraid to be wrong. And I think that's a lost cause, unfortunately. Yeah, I completely agree. Like I look at it um, in this standpoint, right? Like I, instead of like growing your business being like the education system, I look at it as if it's like a sporting game. Um, and I think with sports, you know, not the, the kids these days where everyone gets a fucking medal, um, but <laughs> no, I, I think, else. you know, with sports and you Take want often. to, you know, when we're looking at it, right, say you're being in a running race, okay, and you're running with, and say me, I go and I go race all of the people in kinder um, that, you know, is in our son's kinder and we go for a hundred meter sprint. Now, is that going to inspire me? to run as fast as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. No, right? It's not because, you know, if I, and same as when I, okay, shift this back, all your friends are making 100K, okay? And you are currently making 300,000. You know, it, you don't have the push forward to make 1 million or 2 million. It has to be some form of really far, hard internal drive. Mm -hmm. But 
Let's say I go and join a sporting club. I'm not going to go and join the Olympics because I will get beat that by that much. Then that will also defeat me. It wouldn't be inspiring yeah. at all. But I, I go and find people who are three to four seconds faster than me mm -hmm. and, you know, essentially in a 100-meter sprint. And I have to train and I have to work and I have to show up to get better to then close the gap between me and them. And that's all it is. It's like, you know, sports, you don't just show up and you're an athlete. No, you're an amateur. Okay. And every athlete was once an amateur. It's understanding that as well. But if you're an amateur and you only ever play with the amateurs, you're never going to become the athlete because nothing is pushing you forward. So it's proximity to those people who are doing just better than you. And they will automatically pull you up without you even realizing it because it changes your belief. It's like, wow, I can run faster. But that's oh, a wow. That's reflection, isn't it? Because oh. most people would go, okay if I'm chasing this person, you know, and you'd remember um, my dad with the park run and mm. there was that younger guy that my dad was like chasing. Now, obviously my dad's hyper competitive and I think this is where, you know, unfortunately Jackson has inherited two gene pools of incredibly <laughs> competitive people. I feel but, sorry. Yeah, it's very dangerous. But, um, you know, my dad was chasing that younger guy and eventually he beat him. But I think the problem for most people is that if they never beat them, they consider themselves a failure. They never reflect on, wow, this is where I started and this is where I am now. So while I still have room to go or I still have something to push for, I, you have to be prepared to reflect on where you've been because over time we normalize. And, you know, it's one of those really great quotes where it's like over time you think nothing's changed and then you look back and you realize nothing's the same. Oh, one hundred percent. It's super powerful. Reflection is so important. And I think that's the biggest thing, right? So the second habit with the proximity, they're finding rooms of people who are doing just above them, and they strive to, you know, they strive to increase their, I guess, their thermostat. You rise to the heat of the room, mm -hmm. and you know that's that's a crucial key. And then accountability. Mm -hmm. It's actually having someone you respect because if you don't respect the person you're accountable to, right, yeah. and that you don't care about what they're going to say and you don't give it your 100%. And, you know, when you're, you know, showing up to, to telling your stats, you probably won't even show up to telling your stats. You know, I, I think, you know, with this, and this comes back to you as a coach with your clients, if they don't respect you, they're going to, you know, they will take your... Um, your feedback and your education with a pinch of salt. It's the same as when you're doing something for free, they don't respect the information. That same information could be worth $10,000 and you made them pay $10,000 and all of a sudden you've got their attention and respect. So the higher you charge, the more attention that you get from the person and respect and accountability to that system as well. But that comes, again, it's a cycle where you can loop back to the awareness. You know, what have you invested in making people aware of your knowledge of what you know and what you're worth. Because if you're just some guy on the street, there's a lot of guys on the street. Mm. So I think it's just for everyone, it's an understanding that you have to be prepared to push nothing. Even if you do have a coach, even if you are in the gym, just because someone walked into the gym and paid you for a PT session, that doesn't mean they're guaranteed the body. They have to do the work. They have to make those sacrifices. They have to make those decisions. They have to walk away from the morning muffins at the meeting and they have to be comfortable with that decision. And they have to want that decision because the other thing that doesn't come just because you put yourself in an expensive room is they're not going to do the damn work for you the funny thing is the higher up you get the less work people are willing to do for you and you have to do it yourself and you have to make those decisions and you have to make those sacrifices and the hard thing is that people don't like to understand is the further up the ladder you get the more money the more risk the higher up in the organization, if you've got a job, whatever it is, the decisions hurt more and they reflect more on you. And that's a really painful and uncomfortable position sometimes to be in. Well, you know, I think it's like 67% more likely to achieve your result or your goal if you're accountable to someone else. Mm. Um, it's because let's just say we had a call once a week on a Friday and you had 15 tasks to do and you had a really hectic week, then if you didn't have the accountability, then what happens is I you're like, oh, that. I had a hard week and you start justifying all the reasons why you didn't do the work. If you were showing up to have a call with me, uh, you would go and you would work your ass off like Parkinson's law, like if you, you're... The the minutes before, the, maybe. The, exactly, <laughs> right? The minutes before the call, you would get the stuff done, right? Like, you know, the, it doesn't matter if you end up having two days or seven days to do the work. The work that you do starts to, can shrink or expand to the time that you're given to that amount to do the work. My university degree was 
built on oh. 7 a.m. to 12 noon. <laughs> well, exactly Some right. Some of my best friends worked at that coffee shop. But I, but I think you have to understand, like, accountability is one of the biggest crucial factors to doing the tasks and doing the processes, and the processes get the result. And if we don't have accountability, then we sometimes lag. Even if we are the hero, yeah. we sometimes lag because that is human nature, mm. right? Like we And giving the accountability, you know, we follow the diets better. We turn up to the training sessions. We push a little bit harder. We do a little bit more. And having accountability and proximity to someone else, you step just above your comfort zone. You step five percent up it's a bit hard it's a bit fearful but you still get the job done yeah. and i think that is step two of do what you said you would do yeah and also do what the fuck i said for you to do as well <laughs> um i think um I, but i think that's like step two right and then once you have this you, you you go cool i've got accountability i've got some proximity i've got i'm, I'm not a victim I'm a, I'm a hero um i'm a warrior um i think like you got these two things um or you got the trifecta down pat then it's like, okay, cool. You know, to grow your business, you need a consistent marketing um, mm-hmm. system. They're actually going to give you lead generation through multiple reliable. avenues. Yeah. It's reliable, right? It's not like I'm going to put all my my um, eggs in one basket mm-hmm. and just going to rely on Facebook marketing because, you know, like for us, right, for example, um, there's been some Chinese hackers that have, you know, infiltrated, obliterated, um, obliterated our marketing over the last seven days. That's nothing that we did wrong. Um, they've they've just they've hacked. Baby. Yes, 2020 coming 2020. at me. Block, block, block. Um, 100%, right? So, but us, like, they've hacked um, hundreds of thousands of accounts and they've spent $4 billion um, of marketing money um, on, on not ours, not $4 billion of ours. I don't have $4 billion, but they've spent $4 billion on <laughs> Facebook yet. ads that. Um, it's a good reframe, Olivia. Okay. Um, that um, you know, that Facebook's had to refund back to those people, and it's like, so if we had Shit all our eggs us. in one basket then we'd be screwed. But instead, we got Facebook groups, we got referral systems, we got email marketing, we got past reactivation clients, we got YouTube marketing, you know, we've got IG marketing, we've got, so it's like, we've got like, we've got like, there's the top of the funnel. And at the top of the funnel, like Facebook ads is one, referral marketing is the other, email marketing is the other, our Facebook group is the other, you know, past activation clients is the other, mm-hmm. outreach is the other. So we've got like seven or eight Worst different case, pokers. Start walking around the supermarket. One hundred percent, right? Worth is a raring place right now. It's the only place people can go, <laughs> especially in Melbourne, right? <laughs> but it's like, but with this, you have like seven to eight pokers in the fire. Yeah. Now, like direct response marketing through paid advertising is obviously a very um, lucrative, lucrative. R- ROI on time and money, right? Yes. So that's why it is one of the pokers in the fire. But if you only had one poker in the fire and that poker essentially is pulled out. It's very low barrier to entry. 100%. It's, very, it's like the keyboard warrior. Like you just have to sit there, plug in a thing. You don't really have to do anything. There's no real chance of rejection except for Karen who comments on your ad saying, hey, this person doesn't look like a real person. Okay, Karen, I can see that. that is well, not photoshopped. Photo shot. Photo yeah. shot. <laughs> um, Good for you, Kaza. I was like me. It's like his tattoos on the other arm now. I was like, mate, it's, it's called a mirror. mirror. Um, but it's like, but when we're looking at this, it's a reliable marketing it system, is. right? It's so fantastic. it's like, but you know. You, like you don't use hope. Job. You don't use hope-based marketing. No. You don't just rely on word of mouth, okay, which some people do. It's like, oh, I hope these people get me referrals this month. No, you have a referral system. And this referral system you have driven with data, which is one of the oh, other yeah. points down the, down, down the uh, seven habits. But it's like, I know I get five referrals every month. Okay, sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's four. But on average, I get five because of the systems I have in place. I know that I get, you know, from email marketing, I get five leads a month. I know from my Facebook group, I get 10 sales a month. I know from my um, two-step strategies with organic marketing, I get 10 sales a month. Like I, like I know I pull off Instagram one sale every single – like like so I know – the data with reliable systems that get the result. But that's the thing. It's it's over consistent repetition. So, you know, we would be uh, obviously this month completely lying if we said every single month we get this many leads because this month we will probably mm. not get the same number of leads courtesy of the business manager. We'll have lots of other leads coming in, but we'll have to dial it up on the other avenues to hit the overall lead target. So I think what you're saying is like having the system doesn't guarantee the outcome. But what the system has is it tells you and the data, as we're going to go into, will point out to you why it didn't work this month. And is there something that we need to dial, shift, change, monitor, measure, a bit like a macros, a bit like your programming. If you didn't hit the 
perceived or the hypothetical goal weight loss or muscle gain, why not? Maybe we need to up the protein. Maybe we need to down the carbs. Maybe we need to up the hit. Maybe we need to do some more, you know, heavy lifts, like whatever it is. Were you hitting the actual, you know, were you pushing yourself in sessions? Like all of these little things, these micro decisions are like investigations. But if you hadn't set the goal and you just lost some weight, well then how can you fine tune? 100%. 100%. I think when we're looking at this, um, consistency is the biggest thing these million dollar fit pros have. Yes. I think, you know, if you look over the span of time, they have reliable marketing that gives them certainty on their business growth. And I think that's the key thing. The, the key word is certainty. Mm-hmm. Because if I tell someone who doesn't have a reliable marketing plan to put $3,000 on Facebook ads, they don't have the certainty in, certainty in that. They shift back up to step one. They shift into victim mode and they screw up their ads. Yeah. So I I think if you can understand and upskill yourself or get someone to give you the skill um, or, you know, whatever it is, you need to move the needle forward to an 8 out of 10 or a 9 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 in understanding how to acquire leads Mm -hmm. through the different avenues. So it's moving the needle in your knowledge base, which gives you certainty yeah. Okay, in actually doing the skill, um, which then cuts him out of time it take, takes to do the skill. Yeah. So then all of a sudden it becomes even more effective. And over time, I think that's what they did. They didn't give up. They learned how to do the skills. They got better at the skills. Then they either outsourced the skills because they know what they should get for the ROI, for the dollars spent. So now they're a knowledge-based hiring um, or they continue to do the skills. You know, if you don't know, if you want to be, have a million-dollar fitness business, you know, your lead generation needs to be between about 60 to 110 leads a week of people acquiring to do your service if you have an intro offer and an upsell program. Um, Now, a million dollar fitness business is something that anyone can do. You know, you just have to have a consistent marketing system. Uh, I think, you know, for you, if you don't know how to get consistently 100 leads a month, if I asked you to do it, Okay, if I ask you, you might be thinking, I don't need 100 leads a month. And it's like, if I ask you to get 100 leads a month every single month, do you know how? And if your answer is yes, it's like, fantastic, then you know how to have a consistent and reliable marketing system. If you say, no, I have no idea how, then, okay, then there's, gonna, there's a gap mm-hmm. in the skill level between where your marketing is and where your marketing needs to be. And everything is closing the gap on these million dollar habits. But what got you to this point in your business will not get you to the next no. level. I mean, it's a very well-known adage, but again, I don't think people like applying it to themselves. You know, they'll go, well, I'm very successful with just referrals. And I'm like, excellent. Well, you don't rock up to sessions and you let your staff do all the sessions and you tell me how those referrals are going because it's a different, it's a different model. It's a different requirement to get to that next level. If you don't want to be the one at the 6am sessions, you've got to be prepared to deliver the people. Yeah. The business can't be around you. Like I remember, um, you you know, when I left, right? Like people left and you know, not everyone, but people left because it's a different different aura, Mm. Um, you know, it's different energy in the side of the sessions. Mm. And, you know, I think with this, you know, when I was doing marketing for the gyms, I could say, hey, I'm doing a seminar. I could get 100 people to a seminar and I could sell 40 people straight away. Mm. Um, Like, you know, a coach who doesn't have the similar style following as I did in the fitness genre back then, Mm. can't just put up an organic post saying they're going to do a seminar and have 100 people rock up. If they did... It's still time. Yes, you got to put in the work and you got to put in the time to do it. But I think with this, you know, your marketing has to pivot as your business pivots. Mm. I, you know, when we grew the the 20 gyms and and the $10 million business, it's like I couldn't put posts up all over the world and have put a post up in Detroit and say, hey, come and do a seminar with me. Like no one knew, knew me there. And no one knew how I, how I was. The marketing had to pivot. Yeah. And, the, and the, so it has to be reliable on a different system to actually get the leads in and get the sales in and actually get the business to get the growth. But isn't that hilarious? Because it's, it's that sense of entitlement. And that's what find, I find funny about people with marketing is, you know, mm-hmm. and again, like the concept of unqualified leads. Like you'd be sitting there going, well, this is unqualified leads. It's like, no, they just don't know who you are. It's just awareness. Like, it's just awareness. <laughs> like, exactly. Like figure it out, guys. And like there's two different ways to get them aware. You can either pay money to put more, you know, content. video and content in the news feed to increase the awareness that way. And I think that's something you can do and then do a two-step style Facebook marketing strategy and retarget those people because they're more aware of you. Or okay. you can get them in. 
you can get them in on some form of intro program that where they're paying for it at a slightly reduced price and they're becoming more aware then and once they're more aware they also buy so either way it still works it's you just to do it organically like there's lots it just takes more time and I think that's what people need to understand. There are many ways to roam. There's many roads to roam. But what you need to be aware of is what are you willing to give time or money? Because you can walk around, you can do the old school like 250 list. You can go talk to your A's, your B's, your C's. You can go and talk to the local businesses. You can post stories. You can do Instagram posts. You can do emails. You can post content on your, you know, on your Instagram so that people can look through. Like, I mean, I think if anyone looked at your Instagram, they would see like, millions and millions of content and it's very clear what you're about mm. so i think you know people come to a platform and they review and they understand they like your you know in all coaching and you say people left when you left of course because they're it's a very emotional business coaching someone is an emotional business either coaching them in business or coaching them in in the gym there is a reliance on that person you have chosen this person to help you on the journey and so you need to be aligned with that person so also the concept that you can help everyone in my opinion is a is a flawed concept 100 percent. and um i think if you're relying on the organic strategies mm -hmm. you have to have somewhat of an obsessive um personality okay. um so like myself i have a very obsessive personality and i haven't missed a post on instagram i think in three years now I, every day i've posted at least once a day on instagram on a hard post uh, posted even the day i was giving birth yeah you know, i was probably just like hey lives having a baby you know I, we need to push back this webinar we're doing today uh, do, but but, uh, but i think like the obsessive personality and i don't do it as far as it takes away our time as a family or anything like that great time it's because it's a structure well, and it's I, become structure it's a I system think. yeah it's become a system and it's become much more you know it probably like was systems. more they unstructured yeah, yeah. they don't start that way but it evolves because you understand if it's important you find a way well exactly like so the structure for this is i'll do a video i'll pass the video to chris who edits the video i'll put it into dropbox he'll download for dropbox he'll put the titles on the video he'll give it back to me then i'll post it with the contents right and that's that's the structure but it's also well, a no excuses thing because if it's not there the video is not done or there's something wrong with the video you can dropbox isn't working or it's not enough internet like blah 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 get a photo off your fucking phone excuse my french and just post it with an but, inspirational quote and you've done it. But, but yeah, it wasn't like that beforehand. I had to create that system yes. that created the ease of doing it. Mm -hmm. Okay. But at the start, you don't have systems. You just fall forward. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing. But consistent marketing is is step three. And that is the, the, the third habit of the Million Dollar Fit Pro. I don't want people using that as an excuse. Like they've got to go to Upwork. I've got to find someone to edit my videos. It's like just do it first well, and start to establish the habit. It's like the Seinfeld method. Just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, and eventually you create the system. Well, 100%. Like, if you don't know the Seinfeld strategy, guys, you can Google Seinfeld strategy for productivity and, and you can figure that out. Or you can opt um, one of our downloads. I'm yeah. pretty sure I talk about it in one of our emails. And um, I think for that, you know, it's time or money as well, mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, I, I don't have the time to edit shit, so we hire someone to do it. Mm -hmm. And oh, I think okay. time or money, like, you know, you look at the, you know, 80% of the 20%, it's like the 20% of the tasks that give us 80% of the money, mm -hmm. okay, that is not part of the 20%. So it's an outsourced delegated task. Make uh, money. And as you make more money, you need to start delegating the 20% that gives you the least reward in revenue. You know, keep some of the fulfillment if you enjoy it. Um, but you start delegating that lowest 20% until you really only have that core stuff. Yeah. And I think that's a crucial thing is that's productivity. Um, but the next thing, the next thing is they've changed their sales mindset. I think this is the fourth habit, um, you know, of the Million Dollar Fit Pro. Yep. They, they've changed their sales mindset and they understand like one sale a day, every day. I'm going to make a sale a day. And I, I think, you know, they also see ser like essentially sales as service, not as they see it as a positive thing rather than a negative thing. Mm -hmm. I think this is such a crucial thing. Um, so with this, I look at it as this, my job as a fitness professional owning a gym, you know, is to make sure that I'm helping a minimum of one person every single day of my life yeah. move towards their goals. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't matter if they buy or not, 
all it matters is that I served one person every single day of my life to move them forward to their goals. And that is, that, that's a character trait. That's an identity that you can, you know, embody and live with. And it's... That well, it might be the hero version of you. Yeah, the hero version of you, right? But it's also um, disconnecting. It's completely disconnecting the outcome from the process because I think if we go, I must make sales every time or whatever it is, it's like, yes, we want to look at the stats and how can we refine the sales process and how can we make sure we're closing and all that sort of stuff. Um, we'll talk about closing in a second, but how can I just serve someone every day? And I think that's the biggest thing. It's like stop focusing so much on like the sale and start focusing on why you go into the fitness industry, which is to change lives. I, I hope. Um, yeah, failure ultimately sales if, is a, is a defined win or loss and people don't like those scenarios. They hide from those scenarios. Yeah, I, I think so. It's like having, um, I think it's an ego check, right? It's having, having the humility to go through conversation after conversation, getting feedback and the feedback is someone saying no um, and refining your skill set as a communicator um, to be able to convey that them being in your life, their life will be better. Mm. And I think if you can convey that properly, like if, if you're, you're in my life, your health and fitness will be better because of it. Yeah. And if you can convey that with an outcome that they're going to achieve from it in a certain amount of time, okay, that they're like, okay, that's worth it. And it's like they're worth the time they're going to spend with you, the money they're going to give to you, and that you've educated them enough that their life will be better with you in it, then they'll buy from you. True. I love it. Then sales, ob overcoming objections. The next thing is it's coming through this again. I just want you to, to really – hone in on it. The, the average person doesn't buy without objections. Um, the average person has three objections. You know, the, it's like, oh, I don't, know, don't have enough money. And it's like, okay, cool. You know, you, you stop them. <laughs> it's like, if you don't have enough money, you should have done this earlier in the sales conversation to define how much money they're making without them realizing it, seeing how much money they're spending on chocolate and cookies and ice cream and Ben and Jerry's and, um, you know, date like nights and alcohol and, well, you know, all the rest of it, right? You know, so you could have that sort of stuff written down beforehand. So, you know, essentially sucks. it's data. Yeah. You just need a better script that you follow. Um, but it's the data you're getting from them. It's like, uh, then also it's uh, breaking it down on a um, daily basis. It's like, if it's $70 a week, it's like, oh, yeah, it's $10 a day. How can we work together? You said you wanted to achieve X result in Y time. How can we, you know, in 12 weeks, how can we find $10 a day for you to pay this so we can change your life? because you've been wanting to do this for the last two or three years. So together, can we find 10, if we can find $10 a day, do you agree that you can do the, do the, the course with us or do the challenge or do the whatever it is to achieve the result? And then they can say yes, and you can start to work through their budget with them. Like that's one. And then the other one is like, oh, I have to ask my partner is another one. I have to ask, these are all push away tactics, right? You really have to get them bought in before you get to the objections, but then you have to be, have the, um, the lack of fear, okay, to step outside your comfort zone and help them work through their fear, which is why they're actually giving you objections. Mm. I love like, some of the greatest, my greatest sales conversations have involved a lot of silence because mm. there's, you know, a discomfort in silence and people are desperate to feel silence. They don't like it. So it's a really powerful tool to just let people keep talking. And I think something that a lot of people struggle with in sales is the desire to be right or the desire to fill that gap or the desire to speak more than they listen. And I think if you start listening, that makes the greatest salespeople. And because most successful people aren't driven by that outcome, they're actually enjoying most of their sales conversations. They are listening because they are wanting to come from a place of help. The people that usually struggle with sales are because they're four steps ahead about to ask for the credit card, but they're not actually listening to what this person is saying. So there's a disconnect in the sales process because you're not trying to help them. You're trying to sell them. 100%. I completely agree. I think when we're looking at this, it's getting that down pat. So it's understanding hero's mindset. It's understanding proximity and accountability. It's understanding consistently, Jen, understanding serving, not selling, um, which results in sales. Um, and then it's it's going to the next one, which is the fourth habit of the Million Dollar Fit Pro. Uh, they're, they're allowing data 
too this good. Is fifth. So it's the fifth one. Yeah, we just did four. Four. So Ooh, so. I'm moving so fast through this. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, well, time is but an emotion. So if you're enjoying this podcast, it might seem like it's flying by. Um, so when we're looking at this, guys, I think the next one is the fifth one, which is um, understanding that data guides the emotions and their decisions and productivity. So I, I think, you know, this is my... Well, we talked about so many things. When? On this podcast already? Yeah. I feel like we've talked so much about data. <sighs> yeah, because data is the king. It's critical. It is critical. It's the data is everything, right? So uh, well, I don't personally feel like we've talked about this. Um, I feel like that this is, you know, looking at the inner workings of me and Liv's relationship now. Um, it's like, I, I feel like we've had this conversation. No, Liv, we didn't decide what we're going to have for dinner. I had a really great conversation about this in my head. Yeah. It's like, well, this is when Liv's told yeah, me before. I swear years. I told you I was going, I'd already told you that I was going to do this. I was like, no, you didn't tell me. This is, now this is a recorded live situation <laughs> where you've seen that Liv makes stuff up. Um, so with this, guys, I have to understand that data, not emotions, guides our decisions and our productivity. So data is king. Now, this is, I think, you know, with, with productivity as well. So it's, it's let's go to the marketing and the sales side first and the numbers side because numbers are everything. You know, what you can't measure you can't manage. Mm -hmm. And that's data. So it's understanding what's my members. It's cash flow. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, but it's everything, right? So right. it's like when we're looking at this, it's, it's measuring our time of how long we're spending on content creation. It's measuring our time on how long we're spending on dialing sales. It's measuring our time, how long we're spending on customer experience and getting the results with our clients. Like this is all data. And it, every single when we're looking at this is how how is this gu data guiding our decisions? So, you know, and... It, what's the return on them? Because I think, you know, again, there's a comfort level in the, the tasks that you're competent in and so a lot of people will sit in those you know a lot of people I have to tell you are very good at reading emails very competent at reading emails they're probably not the best ROI on your time mm. but you very know, competent at scrolling social media as well yeah, very good at um, scrolling the algorithm so, gets me <laughs> it's a um, but when we're looking at it right so it's like okay cool where is my member numbers what is my average um, transaction value per month or per week for my members what is my current churn so what's my retention percentage what's my lifetime value how many leads do I get per month how many on average if you don't know that you've got to know it I keep, I keep like getting distracted my dog keeps walking past with more and more food um, I feel and that's cat food. So he's walking through packets of cat food past the window. I don't know where he's getting this cat food from. Sorry for everyone listening to the podcast right now, but he's walked past over the time we've done this podcast with like seven packets of cat food. And I keep wondering why we keep buying cat food. Um, every single week because we have these stray cats at the house that Liv has decided to feed. Um, and Hercules has literally walked past decided. with seven, seven, I know no, you decide for a year. Uh, I know <laughs> Liv's adopted two cats. They're right? barn cats. They um, keep mice but he's walked past with seven packets of cat foods whilst we've been doing this, this podcast. I think he's going to turn into a cat. Um, everyone on farms has cats. Any, anyway. So when we're looking at the data, that's the data number there, seven packets of cat food. But when looking at this, if you don't know how many leads you average or how many leads you're trying to get to get the amount of sales, then you don't know your business. Mm -hmm. You should know, I get X leads per month. The conversion of those leads are 53%. Yeah. And to get 53% of those leads, they actually pay me this. So my cost per acquisition is this. So it's going to cost me $63 to get a $197 client. And I know this data. And I know that, you know, the, and when we're looking at the data of the time, if I'm doing a 28 day challenge, I know by the data that I must sell them by day 21 to get the best conversion rate, to get 67% upsell rate. And I know that as soon as I upsell them, they stay for an average of 52 weeks for so the LTV of that client. Okay. So it's 52 times $60. So it's like $3,000. So I know these numbers, right? And like, so like that is data as far as your business growth. And then if we want to massage the business, okay, we want to increase the business. We look at, okay, how can I increase the, the average transaction? So how can I I add more things in? How can I add supplements in? How can I add massages in? How can I add retreats in? How can I add cross-selling and promotions? Then I can look at how can I look at the lifetime value? How do I go increase the average transactions? So how do I go to 54 weeks? How do I go to 63 weeks? And that will start to increase my business as well. Or I look at the front end. Right? You can't do it all at once. And I no. think this is what people need to understand is that 
you know, one of the things I used to love the most about when we used to do strategy calls and anyone who's been on a strategy call over the last, what, like eight years forever with um, travel myself is that, you know, they're very educational, you know, like, cause we really do like want to understand back in the day, like I used to talk to people and want to understand deeply of what was going on with their business. And this really powerful moment where people would realize the problem that they thought they had wasn't the problem that they mm. really had at all. And even for now, when people come into the coaching and we'll jump on a coaching call and almost because we've been through it with so many people, you can pinpoint instantly that what they think their problem is, isn't their problem. You know, so many people come to us, oh, I don't get enough leads. It's like, no, you do. You just don't convert enough of them. Yeah. So you've got like 30 people coming in. That's not a bad number of leads, guys. You don't need 100. You can't service them. You can't call them. You can't text them. We can't follow them all up. You only need the 30. The 30 is great. You need to convert more than two of them. Oh, exactly right. But also like, even if you could get more leads, let's not get more leads right now. Let's actually improve your <laughs> system so we don't just have a, yeah. a, a higher broken system. Mm. Okay. Let's actually fix the tap before we put more water through it. Yeah. And I think, you know, otherwise it's a, there's a, it's a leak in it and you're forever filling the bucket. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess, you know, with this, it's understanding those key metrics and that's business. And then once you understand that, those data set points, okay, it's not allowing emotions yeah. guide your decision. Because with that, it's like if you know the data, the cost per lead, the cost per sale, so you understand that cost per acquisition, yeah. and all of a sudden leads are $35 instead of, you know, $12, mm -hmm. you're like, you're not going, oh, my gosh, I can't stop spending my money. Like, the, lead, the I'm not converting enough. It's like, you know, it's like, okay, cool. It's gone from $67 per acquisition to $73 per acquisition, or it could have dropped to $60 per acquisition because your conversion rate's higher on these leads, right? So the data is actually giving you the decisions that you uh, are making, and it's the logic decisions they're yeah. not emotional decisions but i love that because so many times you'll hear people go oh well, i don't want to i can't my, my members won't want this or you know i've had someone say to me quite recently the members won't refer people because sometimes there's not enough people in the session so it's almost a one-on-one -on -one. and i was like this is that's not a good member like you can't fight for that limitation like you can't fight mm. for the fact that i'm not going to have enough people in this session so that we have a one-on-one -on -one because that's where you gain value. And it's a really, systems aren't evil guys. Like a lot of the things when we talk to people and we talk about systemizing the, you know, client journey or the mm -hmm. upsells process or the sales process or the onboarding process or a challenge process, systemizing it to have checkpoints and data points because without a system or a checkpoint or a data point, the data is useless because you're not tracking anything or you're tracking different things every time and no one knows what's going on. But there is a method to the systems. You know, I don't want everyone to look at this and go, it becomes like a robot. You know, people are just going through and people love, you know, the personal interaction. You don't love the personal interaction. You want to have a, a you know, a switch off point at some mm. point, you know, like everyone has to understand that there's a sacrifice that comes with scale. And well, that if, means if that you don't, might not be able to you're never going to take a holiday. Yeah. Like you can't text every member. And you know what? At the end of the day, unless you've had all your members for the last 10 years of your business, they don't value that. They value it for as long as it's important to them and then they'll move on. So you are fighting for that limitation through a lack of systems because you don't know how to replace them. Exactly. So I think we're looking at the productivity side of things now. It's going, okay, great. So how many dials should you do in an hour? Okay, for your sales, you know, that I think, you know, everything's data. So I want to come back to productivity. So it's like, how long should it take for you to write a Facebook post? 30 minutes. How long should, how many videos should you do on a Monday, you know, between two and three? And so it's like, we're looking at the data in every single aspect. And, you know, business is boring, guys. You know, I think you have to understand that business is boring. You've got to gamify it to actually make it exciting. Um, and that's that's such a crucial thing. It's like you've got to gamify it, and this is the next part down below. Um, but you gamify the data. So I, I'm going to move to step six of there's only two left, guys. There's only two left, step six and seven of the million dollar business. Um, so discipline, monthly structures, embracing the boring, winning the day, and gamifying the week. I think – you know, a business that hits a million dollars uh, with a decent profit, okay, um, is, is all about structure. And the wolf of it, it's not. It's the boringest shit um, done month in and month out 
with a relentless pursuit of success. And I think that regardless is... Regardless of the failures along the way. But it's also regardless of if you fucking want to do it or not. I think, you know, we, we again, it's like you take your emotions out as per point five. You have embrace the, the boring. You have the accountability. Shit. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but that's what I didn't actually mention inside accountability. I didn't mention it. You want someone to keep you accountable who's going to pull you up on your Make bullshit. It no, it's like, dude, like, they're like, oh, I didn't do it this week. And it's like, mate, that is not good enough. You are better than this. Get your shit together. Step up to the plate or you're never going to get the goal that you're after. I think that is such a crucial thing. Like with accountability, you need someone to call you out on your shit. That is so crucial. Yeah. The next thing, guys, so... Discipline Luckily for us, that's each other. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Um, so like with this, or like what we need to do is we need to go discipline monthly structures. So it's what are you doing to win the day? What five things are you doing every single day to win the day? And it's going, are they the things that are going to move me forward? You know, do I have three business things and do I have two personal things? My personal thing is, am I going to train? Am I waking up on time? Or am I hitting my nutrition or whatever it is like that? You know, the business things. Did I get three leads today? Did I do make one sales conversation today? You know, did I reach out to one member today and give them a positive experience? It's like every day you do these five things to win the day and you do these five things five days a week or yeah, six days of the week and then you win the week and it's gamifying it. And and I then think you that's win the, the long term as well, because sometimes people go, but I didn't, you know, I reached out to a past member and they just said thanks or, you know, they didn't answer me. But it's the consistent repeti repetition of that behavior that will reap you the long term benefits of that person feeling like you care. Well, 100 percent. Right. Like you. if you if you're reaching out to 10 members a day every single day. So 10 members a day, every day. Two would be good. That's, oh, yeah. But let's say 10. That's 50 members a week. Mm -hmm. That means you're going to cover your 200 members, if you have 200 members, every single month, right? And everyone gets reached out to in a personal way based on the love languages that they like, okay? So it's acts of service, it's a gift, it's, a, you know, words of affirmation or something like that. Uh, I think, like, you're reaching out to them in the way that matters to them. So it and could be in a session, guys. It could be a text. It could be they're not well. And I think one of our staff members once sent – a girl who had an accident, Uber Eats to her hotel, like to her um, hospital. Hmm, exactly. But I think if you're looking at this, they've gamified it and they understand if they won or they lost the day. So these five things that make you win or lose the day, you can do other stuff on top of them, but you do a minimum of them. Mm -hmm. And that, you, you know, you essentially you won the day. Great. If I want to win the month and actually increase my business, yeah. then I need to do it like four times out of six days of the week. Mm -hmm. I need to do it essentially 16 to 17 to 18 times a month. And if I'm winning 18 days out of the month, I'm going to win the month. And I start winning the month. Then if I win two months of the first quarter, I'm probably going to win the quarter. If I win three quarters out of the four quarters, I'm going to win the, uh, I'm going to start winning the year. I think that's such a crucial thing. So the last thing is this, right? It's the relentless pursuit of Kaizen, okay? It's that Japanese philosophy of 1% better across the key metrics every single week. It's the attitude of constant and never-ending improvement. It's like, that. that's it. Like, they don't just get to 500K and sit still. They don't just get to 750K and sit still. They don't just get to a million dollars and not improve their business. They're constantly working on themselves. It's 1% better, 1% better. They're constantly looking at the key areas. It's like the productivity, their mindset, their marketing, the sales, the customer experience, their management, their leadership. And they're trying to move the needle forward across all the different aspects. They look at the next quarter and they're like, which ones, so they'll rate themselves, okay? So if you look at the business wheel of life and you go, okay, if I'm going to rate myself on my marketing, it's like seven out of 10, okay? What would make it go to eight out of 10 over the next quarter? And they'll detail a plan to go from seven out of 10 to eight out of 10. They write down why it is at seven, what it would look like at eight and what they need to do. What's the key focus is to get it to eight out of 10. Maybe it's to become an authority in the marketplace and they'll work at that for the next quarter to push it to eight out of 10. And I think the, the Kais, pursuit of Kaizen is, you know, essentially it's like Abraham Maslow. It's like what one can be, one must be in life. And it's constantly that self-actualization. I think a lot of people, a really powerful way I like to look at this is, you know, the 
that show, the 2020, you know, with the NFL guys, with the money, people, the amount of people that go broke after they've won the Tats Lotto. And I think if you have an understanding that it's the habits and the resilience and the lessons that you have learned from your journey from nothing to your million dollar business that empower you to be a better million dollar business owner, to gain more profit from that same million dollars, to be a better leader, to have more staff engagement, to have better results for your members, to continue to eternally strive to make the things better is because you had to do that at every level of your business to get to this magical arena that people think is the arena, which I've got to tell you, once you're there, you're constantly just striving for the next arena. And, you know, Bill Gates didn't stop at a million dollar business. Uh, Elon Musk didn't stop at a million dollar business. There is There are levels beyond what we all think. You know, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk are in a fight to bloody hit Mars, guys. Like, And we're talking about a million dollar fit pro business. Like there is just stuff out there. And if it is given to you, you will squander it. You have to earn it for it to mean anything. We teach this to our children. We understand this in our life. If you earn it, you value it. If you're given it, it's gone. So everyone has to understand what you are doing, what you are building. These are the foundations of what will make you the best business owner and allow you to continue to succeed in whatever you do. It is the habits. It is the Kaizen. It is the little things that add up to the big things. If you are given it, it will be gone tomorrow. And that is it. That is the seven habits of the million dollar fit pro business so guys if you are uh, want to get better. Yeah, what was that go be better go be better um if you want to uh grow your fitness business and you want 30 clients guaranteed um in 12 weeks or less um uh, then go to fitproformula.com and you can register and we are willing to actually have a conversation with you and serve you and yeah, see if we're the right Wednesday. fit and i think um you know with that you know we, we jump on the calls every single week and we make sure that our clients truly get served and change their business which ultimately ultimately changes their life so that's it for the travis jones show with olivia jones um thank you for tuning in guys